Hey, how you doing? Thanks for downloading the show. This is Garden Fork Radio, your eclectic DIY podcast. It's me, Eric, the host, with my co-host. We talk about what we think are interesting things. Today, we're going to talk about amateur space rockets and a new YouTube channel about history with my friend Rick. Welcome, sir. Ah, Good morning, my friend. How are you? I'm great. I want to talk about these these guys in Denmark that are going to put someone up in space. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> but we can do the usual hello first. Yeah, well, you know, there there was a guy out in uh, out west in the Salt Lake area, I think, but out in the Salt Flats uh, from the Flat Earth Society that kind of launched himself into oblivion uh, just not too long ago. Yes. But maybe this is a more professional operation than he was running. He, his is. was pretty shoestring. If you hear a uh, noise in the background, it's... Uh, we're up at the house and it has been raining for a week and it is what Rick would call a malarial swamp up here. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I got to have a, it's just so sticky. <laughs> I got the yeah. fan pointed at me. There's no air conditioning up here because we, it usually only gets hot for maybe a week up here in New England and right. it's been hot and raining for three weeks. It feels like. Wow. You know, uh, last night we had a real uh, gully washer. The the Skeeter ditch here is full. And um, we had 2.25 inches or so last night. Uh, So really nice, uh, nice rain. Uh, We've had a lot of rain all summer long, which is unusual for us. So my tomatoes and okra are doing just, just great. Oh, great. Oh, one more program note. Um, this week's podcast, which is going to post last week, we are listening to this. Okay, so last week's podcast, I did a little. Uh, Rick, you haven't heard it yet. I I went to Manhattan and I made a podcast about it, and so many people have been like, Eric, I th- I thought the subways were flooded in New York City. I saw this video. There are. There are 400 some subway stations in New York City. There's probably 1,500 to 3,000 stairwells in those subways. And one stairwell flooded. Someone made a shot a phone video and uploaded it. And now everyone in the world thinks that the whole New York City subway system is underwater. Well, but they think you're Germany or something. Yeah. They are truly having problems in Germany. And we're like, I mean, the subway system is below ground. It's below the uh, what's it called? The water line under your you know underground the, whatever that the level water, is. The water table. The water table, and there are pumps everywhere that are constantly pumping. And we just got a, a dumping rain, and yeah, rain happens. So yeah, it does. But transportation happens too. Right. And, you know, the city is built. There is a resilience built into the system. But I was just more of rolling my eyes about how people believe one video that they saw on TikTok or Twitter or something instead of um, like the PBS NewsHour. Right. (laughs) Right. Context is everything. Yeah. So the city is not underwater. Anyway. Okay, well, that's good to know. You guys haven't been underwater since Sandy. Correct, but that it yeah. was a huge effect there. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, I certainly don't mean to minimize the uh, troubles of the folks in Bavaria. Um, they uh, have had a uh, uh, just a, a real gully washer there and done a lot of damage, lost a lot of lives. So, um, you know, weather is changing, whether you, um, you think uh, climate change is responsible or not. Uh, boys take an issue with people who, um, you know, think that, well, you know, the climate changes and so what, uh, you know, that's not the question. The question is how do we deal with trillions and trillions of dollars of sunk infrastructure, uh, along the coast, houses along the coast, uh, roadways along the coast. Um, how do we deal with protecting all that? Or do you retreat and abandon all that infrastructure and rebuild it again? You know, those are the real questions. And, and just the fact that human beings, life generally, the human beings in particular, exist in a very narrow range or thrive. They might yes. exist, but they thrive in a very narrow range of temperature and pH uh, and 
and humidity or um, precipitation. And I mean, we we live in just a very narrow band of, of all the possibilities. And any changes in that makes a um, for a, a terrific uh, relocation uh, and expenditure and abandonment of properties. And um, it's uh, it's unthinkable in a lot of ways. I mean, it's you can't contemplate it. That's a kick in the head. But anyway, we're going to talk about a couple other things today. Um, the, in the New York Times was an article about a gentleman who has a YouTube channel called Skipped History. And he is a, I guess you'd call him a monologuist. He, I think he injects some comedy. He's like a historical speaker. And he, what his focus is, and I'm going to paraphrase this, is uh, one of the videos I w- w- uh, watched about his was a a book written by some, I would just kind of call them generically racist in the 1900s, became a history book in public schools and kind of shaped the the thinking of a lot of people. And he's kind of showing that there is more to history than just the the white guy history, if that's a it's a, if that's a phrase or not. And I was very interested in it. It's not the most riveting. I mean, it's him talking to the camera. It's not the most riveting YouTube. But if you're into history and into how people can have effect on history and effect on people, it's uh, it's quite good. And he's just like very approachable. And I like that. And the fact that he's in the New York Times, I think I hope his channel gets get, you know, kind of gets big because um, I think we need more of that kind of information out there. Not not just people telling you how to fix your lawnmower and build a raised bed, you know? Yeah, well, but those things are important now, day-to-day uh, process. Yeah, one of the things that rivets me about the, the whole concept of history is, one, it tends to be more of a mythology used to unite people than a uh, uh, real history, but it's also it gets locked in place. And I was thinking about my um, uh, wife's grandmother who came to West Texas in a wagon and lived to see men on the moon. Wow. And you think about from the time we were born until now, how much real history has taken place yet. Uh, we still have a K through 12 system that teaches fairly minimal history. And so things are constantly having to be thrown out and rearranged and, and reprioritized just to get the basics in. Um, you know, I know that, you know, that we, we tend to expand K through 12 our learning. You know, when I showed up in, uh, in uh, kindergarten, I was expected to be a, a tabula rasa. I was a blank slate. <laughs> and, uh, you know, kids now, they show up and they know their name and they know their parents' name and they know their colors and they know some of their numbers and some of the letters. And, and that's just going into school. So we're starting that kind of education sooner. But the actual history, uh, when we can find it to just uh, – one hour uh, uh, or three hours a week, maybe, uh, and trying to combine and condense all that information into something that's legible, that makes a, uh, a real uh, uh, impact on their thinking about how we got here and who we are and, and uh, what's the rest of the world like and how they get to be the way they are. Uh, yeah, even if, you, uh, if you've graduated college, I don't think you get a real good feel for that. Yeah, I actually, I think, I always think I need to listen to more history podcasts, and then I go down this rabbit hole of listening to true crime podcasts instead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, one of my favorites is a history that deserves to be remembered. It's a uh, from the history guy on uh, YouTube, and he does some uh, interesting little things. But, it, you know, the problem is none of it is systematized. They're just isolated incidents. And, and like this skipped history, a, a, an isolated incident, it's important to know how that developed and played out. But putting it into the, the bigger context of everything else that was going on, um, 
you know, that's that's the real challenge. And that's uh, that's what makes history uh, fascinating, but also a very difficult thing to talk about. What do you think about five dollars a month to get behind the scene photos, pictures of what Eric's been up to, some little walk and talks about what's going on in Eric's world and more pictures of the Labradors, plus just stuff I find cool and interesting that I'm not going to post on Instagram or Facebook because I just it's just too public sometimes, but I'm happy to share it with people that are in the world of Garden Fork. That's what my Patreon thing is all about. It's people like yourselves are kind of like modern day Medici's, Medici's, Medici's. Um, I'm going to screw that up. But basically supporting someone like myself, a content creator directly, rather than having to listen to ads for Audacity or something like that. So if you're interested, there's a link below to sign up, or actually there's a link below just to find out more information. You don't have to do any signing up, but it's patreon.com slash garden fork, patreon.com slash garden fork. Thank you. You know what's even more difficult? What's that? Putting people into space. Uh, apparently not. Everyone <laughs> seems to be doing it now. So I'm a huge fan of the 99% Invisible podcast. You know, I've noticed mm -hmm. that we talk about YouTube channels and podcasts a lot on this podcast, and I'm okay with that because that's my source of a lot of inspiration and information. But the 99% Invisible website actually has, in addition to all the podcasts with deep notes and a whole lengthy text of its own, they have articles about essentially hidden design. You know, why are manhole covers shaped the way they are? Why do they have the designs they do? What are those star things with bolts coming through them on the side of buildings? And at night, um, a lot, I just try and not look at the news a lot because it just crushes me a lot of the time. <laughs> and so I read the 99PI site and they had an article about a gentleman who is building uh, DIY uh, spacesuits, pressure spacesuits. And then as a, just as a link, it said, oh, he's working with uh, the group Copenhagen Suborbital Suborbitals. And I'm Easy like, for you what? To say what he's doing what you know <laughs> so i went to the copenhagen suborbitals uh website and they are amazing <laughs> and so i sent it to rick i'm like look at this <laughs> it's amazing you're right uh, you know i think this is indicative though of how people don't maybe think about government and things in the wrong way uh you know the Government space flight was the realm of the government because it was hard and it was expensive and it was dangerous. And once we got over that hump, now everyone has the knowledge and the technology. They have benefited from uh, our uh, hard won decades long effort to uh, and dangerous process of putting people into space until it's becoming more and more uh, possible. And that's the way it should be. Um, it's like computer chips. The very first computer chips, uh, when it was just a concept, and they wanted to see if it would work. Uh, the government did that. And we built these enormous plants. Uh, they actually call them uh, factories for some reason, but uh, they, they, uh, they build them and they, they, made these enormous run of very simple uh, semiconductor computer chips and they buried about 999% of them and just kept a handful, but it was a proof of concept design. Yep. And now computer chips are, uh, you know, we're up at uh, what, 220 nanometers, I think, uh, is uh, the size of the, uh, the, uh, capacitors and transistors on the chip uh, or the wires. I'm not sure once one or the other. I mean, that's less, much less than hair thin. And it just has progressed from there. But it started off as a government project. It was expensive. It was iffy. Uh, nobody knew if it was really going to work. And then, um, you know, it takes off in the private sector. And that's actually kind of the way government should work. Um, 
uh, in my opinion. So, well, these so guys I'm, have taken. I mean, they're they're kind of in the vein of uh, Elon Musk, except in a very DIY uh, way, and it they are uh, based in Copenhagen. So, and I think there's a certain kind of sensibility to the Danish to just get things done. I mean, if they can live in an area that is constantly uh, being flooded and they pump the water back out, they can put a rocket into space. But their their goal is to put a person in a capsule and achieve suborbital flight. And they're on their way to doing it. They have these YouTube videos that are phenomenal. They've got blog posts about what they're doing. And it's all crowdfunded. And it's not, they're not, they don't have a bunch of venture funding or anything like that. It's just, yeah, we want to do this. And so I, I, I imagine there's a lot of off the shelf availability of data and specs and here's how to build a rocket engine. They built their own rocket engines. You know, I just love this kind of thing, as you can tell. Yeah, well, wouldn't you love your neighbors to be uh, building a rocket engine that big in their garage? <laughs> and their launch pad is a small barge that they float out into the ocean because you know Denmark is not the biggest country so I don't think they have a they don't really have Cape Kennedy Cape Canaveral you know just down the road right and so um I, I think it's just kind of it's cool I I spent a, an hour on their website they live stream their rocket engine tests they uh they're talking about combustion instability in their rocket engines and building valves to turn on the fuel. To, uh, it's just wild. It, and then they're yeah. talking about building the capsule and how ideally it's going to be one of the smaller people on their team because there's less weight and it's easier to build the capsule. So it's called Copenhagen suborbitals.com. So well, as long as they don't use a dog, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. Send yeah, a person I up. Don't. We don't. We send people. We don't send dogs. So you can get a newsletter from them. You can make a donation, or you can join a club, kind of like Patreon, kind of like people that support Garden Fork Radio on Patreon, right, Rick? Right, and uh, I do that. A lot of people support Garden Fork Radio, and we see that all the time. What was the deal, by the way? I noticed that uh, I got notification. You put a video up, and then uh, when I went to find it, it says you'd taken it down. Had you done something mean? The government, the government, the government came after me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, dude. there was a glitch in the middle of the in the video that I had not noticed. And so uh, the, the framing, the video frame just froze for like a minute. And I so I deleted it. And then, of course, I did not have the files with me to redo it. And so I had to jump through some hoops and that will. By the time this podcast goes out, it will be posted as well, and okay. I'll resend it to the email list and to the the patrons. I let them know because I can post it right to the through the Patreon app. I can just put a link in, and it gets email all the patrons. It gets emailed immediately, and they get uh, a notification on their phone if they want to watch it on their phone. And then I will send it out to the email list. The email list, it it's I have to write that. I have to do that all manually, so sometimes it takes a day or two. Or if you're a YouTube subscriber, if you hit the notification bell, which is the gray little bell below a video, they're supposed to put a little reminder on the front of your phone or your your iPad or whatever. But yeah, it'll right. go back up. It's me and my sister hanging a TV on the wall. And I had a couple thoughts about that because you, of course, you haven't seen the video yet, but she has a room in her house that's made into an exercise room and has beautiful light and we both really enjoy a youtube couple their channel name is has fit h-a-s-f-i-t it's heart and soul fitness h-a-s-f-i-t is the has fit is the name of the channel has so little, fit real weird name but it's a uh, it's kind of like a has been it's claudia and coach kogan and it's so approachable. It's not like I started watching some exercise videos, mainly using resistance bands, which I think are so much easier and a brilliant invention versus, you know, barbells and hand weights. Right. And, but 
the people I watched were all buff. They had huge biceps and they're talking about maximizing their, you know, their blah, 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 you know, metabolic, this and that. And, and the Claudia and coach Kogan are like you and I, they, they, they have a lower um, body fat index clearly, but they're just like, Hey, let's exercise. Let's stick with it. Let's follow through. Remember there's a big, there's going to be a great payoff at the end here. So I really enjoy them. And they actually have an app now that I'm going to buy. I think it's $50 a year. And then you can, you can stream the app to your TV. So our idea was to, at my sister's house, get an inexpensive flat panel TV with an inexpensive mount. And we could watch the HasFit videos because we had been putting it on an iPad and watching it, but it's kind of hard sometimes to see what well, you're supposed to be standing up and doing your, with your resistance bands or whatever, doing stretches or exercises. And then the iPad screen's fairly small, so a bigger screen would just make it easier. So it was a lot of fun. Me and my sister's dog, Hector, put the, put the thing up on the wall. and But it's amazing how light flat panel TVs are now. Just they don't weigh anything. Oh, I know. I know. I had a... Um, a uh, uh, it was on a TV stand, and it was a glass sca- stand. And it, I think it was about a 43-inch or something a few years ago, one of the original Sony ones, and it weighed a ton. And yeah. it, it literally broke the glass, eventually fell down on the floor and put a hole in the screen, which makes it hard to watch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oops. Yeah, and you, you put, you know, duct tape just doesn't work. You can't see through it, and it, it's a pain. <laughs> but uh, so we replaced it with another Sony brand, not pitching them that's just the one i got and it was about the same size and it weighed nothing absolutely nothing um used to be two men and a boy to lift it nothing now nothing yeah the mount weighed more than the tv ah you know um uh, i was just thinking about um you mentioned the ipad yesterday she who must be obeyed and i uh went over to the uh, apple store and i did not we I figured battery on her phone was bad for some reason. And I was just getting ready to, you know, shell out for a new phone. And the guy says, you know, we can replace that battery in about an hour and a half and it costs 50 bucks. Ooh. And I said, wow. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) He kind of regretted saying it. I think he he said like, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. (laughs) And then I'll kill soldier a new phone. But, uh, People are always saying, yeah, I'm not going to have a, um, a phone that I can't replace the battery in. But apparently in the in these later models, uh, hers is about a seven, I think. Uh, you know, they're relatively easy to uh, uh, put a battery in. And then you also get the um, the waterproofing, the water seal, which is, uh, is really important uh, for most phones who get left around on counters and dropped in various inconvenient places. Yeah, especially when you live in the malarial swamp of New England. It's <laughs> yeah, Thomas Jefferson absolutely hated uh, New England. Couldn't see how people would live there at all. But then he also referred to this region as a, um, as a malarial swamp. And he's right. Uh, we're not going outside anytime soon. Uh, more rain is forecast. This little front that passed through is uh and dump 2.25 inches on us is going to back over us and uh have a low and slow soaking rain hey are you shopping locally i am shopping locally as much as possible as well if there's something that you need and you can't find it in your local stores and you're going to go on amazon would you consider using the garden fork Amazon link. It's in a, what's called an affiliate link. We get a finder's fee for sending you to Amazon. It helps pay the bills at the podcast world here. It is amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. That's amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. By the way, if you end up with cracked tomatoes, I only, this time of year, I only think about tomatoes and okra. <laughs> Tomatoes and okra, tomatoes and okra. It's because of irregular watering. And if you don't, if they dry out, the skin gets tough and it kind of gets stiff. And then when you water again, the skin, the uh, tomato begins to expand again to grow. 
but that skin will split. And that's the reason you get the um, split skin. So you know, once a day or preferably twice a day uh, to uh, water uh, you know, tomatoes on the vine to keep them from having that problem. Right. It's like, it's like, it's like dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet. Yeah. So. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a, uh, afraid the okra is going to make a snatch for me every time I go out there. Uh, it is just, you can hear it grow. I think it's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's almost six foot tall and we are getting freezer bags of okra. Um, and the, the way we take care of it now is, uh, to stay on top of the, the yield every day or twice a day we'll go out and gather okra and we slice it into you know like half inch rounds and then put it in a pan or on a cookie sheet in the freezer freeze it and then dump it into a bag so it's all separate it doesn't stick together in a big mass but uh yeah we got a couple of gallon bags of it already that's kind of like how you freeze uh raspberries and blueberries is you separate them on a sheet freeze them and then put them in the bag in the freezer ah see uh it, it works really well um but you know that's pretty much all i'm growing this year um i had a little bit of corn it didn't do so good the uh, warm bar worm borers got it and um uh, i've given up on squash and cucumbers and all those things that um that uh, attract bugs faster than i can kill them or that i'm willing to kill them yeah I, I can I can kill them all, but I don't want to eat the food after that. <laughs> well, I've noticed my friends are more of my friends are growing garlic, and the uh, the bulbs are quite small, and they're like, oh, why why is this? I'm like, garlic, they're a huge nitrogen feeder, and if you do not supplement uh, your soil with some sort of nitrogen, be it you know, a time release pellet or uh, a manure with a lot of nitrogen in it. There's all sorts of ways you can do that. Um, you, you've got to, I do it at the get go. I, when I'm planting the bulbs, I, I put a time release fertilizer in the big hole and then I, I, I kind of scratch it into the soil, the top soil um, over the top. But if you, if you do not feed your garlic, it really won't grow that much. Yeah, there there are a lot of things that if you don't start off right, it's going to be really tough to um, to correct it mid course. Uh, tomatoes, uh, I've started uh, uh, putting a um, a tablespoon of uh, Epsom salt, which is magnesium, mm -hmm. in each each hole, as well as a tablespoon of slow release uh, fertilizer, and I use an auger and kind of dig it in a little bit so it's not so concentrated. Right. And I, that way I don't have the blossom end rot problems um, because it gets enough calcium. And um, they, they grow pretty consistently and uh, without too much disease. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that method. But you you got to start off right. You can't um, correct in mid-course with those. You know, that auger, we could probably start off with that auger and we could probably build a rocket ship from that thing. <laughs> You know, I was just wondering, you know, if you if they've been buying up from, uh, I don't know what the equivalent in Copenhagen is for uh, uh, Harbor Freight, but, uh, you know, Harbor, Harbor Freight and Northern Tools Rocket Parts. Well, I have two thoughts on that. First of all, um, my sister and I went to several stores to find an appropriate TV mount for the flat panel TV because we wanted it to tilt down quite a bit because a lot of times you're exercising, you're on the ground. Right. Yes. Yeah. And it's a lightweight 32 inch TV. We didn't need a massive TV mount. And at the uh, different appliance stores and, uh, you know, the Walmarty kind of stores we went to, the TV mounts were like 60 bucks. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not paying 60 bucks. You know who has affordable, simple TV mounts is Harbor Freight. No, I didn't know that. They're the same. There are there clones. I mean, I don't know if they make, you know, they the the one a factory in Asia makes the TV mount and it has the Best Buy brand and the Walmart brand, and then they sell that same mount to Harbor Freight and they stick the Harbor Freight sticker on it. I don't know, but after we paid quite a bit of money for uh, a TV mount, I was happened to be in Harbor Freight. I don't know why, and then uh, it was like twelve dollars or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and then I had another thought that went right out of my head. <laughs> uh, you know, I have been trying to follow your edict of, um, you know, try to buy local first. Yep. And what I was looking for, I got a, uh, I needed to replace the old metal outdoor umbrella stand. You know, the, the pole that goes through the center of the table, the stand rotted yep. out. It was all rusty. And I wanted one of those um, plastic ones that you fill with water. Right. And I went to the yellow, the orange store. I went to the blue store. I went to the military exchange. I went to um, the yellow store and I couldn't find one. I spent an entire day trying to shop local for a fairly simple device. And I ended up getting it off Amazon, but I used the uh, Garden Fork Amazon link. Thank you. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, and it was like $12, and it came in a little box, and uh, I fill it up with water now, and uh, it holds the base steady. And uh, you know, when you kick it, it doesn't really hurt your your foot like uh, break a big toe like I normally do. Uh, oh, I remember my other thought. Um, NASA is trying to read data from the Apollo flights. Mm -hmm. And it was all recorded on some sort of computer tape, you know, some sort of computer reel-to-reel -reel media right. in, in various formats. And so after the Apollo program, NASA went through a big downsizing. And they offloaded a lot of equipment, uh, computer equipment and rocket equipment. So there are scrapyards in Florida that you can buy this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a researcher working with NASA to resurrect some of this data. And they, uh, she had to go to one of the scrapyards and buy a computer <laughs> so they could read the tape. <laughs> But then you could also, if you wanted to build your own rocket ship, maybe these guys already do this, is you, you go to these scrapyards in Florida and buy old rocket engines or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, there's a um, a couple of companies with guys just forethoughtful enough to snatch up all this stuff and store it in humidity-controlled, uh, cl climate-controlled conditions that... Uh, will pull it out to transcribe things like that. And they have, you know, the, do you remember when laser discs were about maybe two foot wide? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I can remember the old Burroughs computer that had a, uh, maybe a three foot disc, a uh, single disc that spun on the Bernoulli uh, principle to uh, keep it stabilized. And it, it was enormous. Well, nobody thought to keep that kind of equipment. But every now and then, somebody needs to pull something off the uh, the old disk or out of the old uh, systems. How to uh, future proof your um, uh, your data is a, a real problem that uh, not only scientists but uh, archaeologists are thinking about. How do we uh, save all the data from humanity? Uh, in some place that is readable in a format that is both sustainable and readable. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because, you know, already you know, we've gone through uh, CDs, DVDs, um, uh, we went VHS and beta. Blu-ray uh, discs. Still, and I'm still, I'm still annoyed that beta didn't win, but you know, that's, <laughs> Uh, that's a personal hobby horse of mine. But yeah, Blu-ray disc, and now we're on to um, just uh, chips. And will they, will that data, even in that format, be readable? Uh, even if it is preserved, will people know how to, uh, uh, looking back, you know, the old 8-bit architecture that uh, we started off with in the uh, 8064 series or 80, 8086 series of uh, computers, uh, is archaic. Um, so uh, it's, it's a fascinating problem. How do you future proof, uh, all the information and data? I don't know. Maybe there's an archivist listening. I would love to, uh, hear about that. Actually, my sister is involved with library data, so maybe she might know something about that. Hmm. Maybe so. We, we should have her on and ask her. Yeah. And ask her how we, our TV we, is. We can grill her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's let's see those abs. How you how you looking there? You know, <laughs> don't don't be interested oh. in my sister, Rick. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so I think people have probably uh, made the uh, trip from their uh, kitchen uh, breakfast table up to their office, and they're ready for their first Zoom call. Okay. It's great that uh, places are opening up uh, safely. There is, uh, in New York City, it looks like September is when people will be going back to offices. So that's, 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 I'm really happy about that. Well, it depends. I think there are a lot of people that are not so happy about going back to their offices, but. Uh... All right. I think we have filled people with some knowledge. They're going to think about making their own rocket ships now. Yeah, things they cannot unsee. They're going to watch some more history on YouTube. Skipped history, it's called. I thought that was pretty interesting. And so Rick and I are going to do a uh, bonus episode for the patrons. But everyone else, if you have any thoughts about what we've talked are you building a rocket ship in your backyard? I'd love to hear about this. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. Radio at gardenfork.tv. Thank you for listening to us, and thank you for your time, Rick. I'll, Rick and I will stick around for a minute here and say nice things about each other. Okay, well, thank you much. We'll talk to you later, my friend. Bye-bye. Garden Fork Radio is produced in Brooklyn, New York by Garden Fork Media, LLC. Our executive producer is Jimmy Gooch. You can learn more about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. The music for our show is licensed from audioblocks.com and uniquetracks.com.